that recording going for all the people who are asking, calling, saying, is this going to be recorded? Yeah, it will. Um, I decided to do a presentation on uh, artifacts um, because I'm mentoring a lot of people and there's a lot of confusion about this topic. Uh, a lot of us don't know the details, uh, maybe don't want to know the details that much because they're technical and electronic and unfamiliar and, and often confusing. So I'm going to attempt to present all this information with minimal confusion and seek to find out where the confusion does exist with a panel and then uh, we'll refine it because this is a topic that often gets left out uh, in neurofeedback. It's crucial uh, though and a lot of people as I mentor them I kind of teach them as they go but there's a lot of panic and concern uh, about things they're seeing and they're not sure what they're looking at and it's very worrisome when you first start training people so we want to kind of go over uh, what's really going on with artifacts and uh, so to do that we really need to know what's normal to begin with and most of you took uh, workshops or, or the New Mind web course, um, probably the web course, it's one of the most popular ways to get um, your uh, didactic hours for BCIA, whatever. Hopefully uh, you studied carefully what the brain waves look like and the best way to be able to identify artifacts is to just really get stuck in your mind, really, really set in your mind what normal EEG looks like. And this is a really good sample here that I found. Um, up at the top is what beta often looks like, although a lot of times if you're looking at brain master, that's what everything looks like because the EEG is so small, but you can hit the plus button, shift plus, and make it bigger if you want to see it more the size that you might see it on our software or thought technology or Nexus and you get a bigger EEG. When you do that you can see more clearly the different kinds of morphologies that are present and it's not just a little tiny trace like this but uh, beta has a lot of bumps in it. Uh, you know, alpha is much smoother you can see uh, this is continuous alpha that's probably more um, pathological alpha. This um, occipital alpha here which is coming and going is um, spindling and that's more common healthy alpha. Um, this line down here is be very low power or you have um, uh, you have a wet uh, cap or some kind of bridging going on. We'll get into that more later. Um, theta uh, tends to look somewhat like this. It tends to be more craggy in a lot of cases because there's some beta mixed in, but it's not as smooth. It tends to look more like it's wider in waveform typically than the alpha, which is a little narrower, but alpha is very smooth, you can see. And then delta is usually big and craggy like this. And then the thing that everybody's always thinking they might see but almost never do, and it's usually artifact, is spike and wave and you should really fix this in your mind. This is what spike and wave looks like. The spike and then a wave and then a spike and then a wave. That's a spike and wave. Um, that's a petite mal but grand mal often looks similar only bigger. So that's what's normal. You want to fix in your mind what's normal because then it's much easier to detect artifact. Most of the things you see that don't look like this, most of the time most of those things are artifact but let's just go over that. Now to understand artifact and EEG waves we need to think of uh, two phase concepts a monophasic and biphasic. Monophasic is usually an upward deflection sometimes it's a downward deflection and that's all you see. A biphasic waveform is up and then down and that's what we usually see with a pure sine wave. There are polyphasic waves like this uh, that would be maybe what you would see with an amplifier clipping. Uh, so we'll go along and kind of categorize the waves a bit by monophasic and biphasic that'll help identify what's going on. 
So common sources of um, artifact are gross body movement, you know, moving around physically, subtle body movement, maybe wiggling your fingers, ear clip movement, your ear clips are hitting something, poor electrode connections, okay, we don't have enough paste or uh, electrodes sitting on the hair, electrode cracks, some of the electrodes can develop fine cracks in them uh, because people take the electrode and they dip it into the um, paste and scoop it out. And that's the worst thing you can do for your electrode because it weakens it. You're constantly uh, putting stress on it. It's better to have a stick of some kind that, that you take your paste out and then gently put it on your sensor. If you're just taking the electrode and dipping it, you're going to break them more often and you may develop a crack and that's the most insidious thing because cracks can produce all kinds of bizarre effects. Uh, we'll get into that more. Dirty electricity, okay, that's very insidious. That can come in many forms. We'll explore that. Uh, powerful local EMF fields, that can also be very invisible and drive people crazy, uh, and static charges also. So those last three are subtle things that people don't really understand much about that often uh, undermine their ability to get a clear signal and they'll often in blame the equipment or call support somewhere and say, you know, there's something's wrong with the equipment or the software. And most of the time it's not, it's the environment. Um, okay. I want to start with alpha artifacts because actually they're very rare and uh, we'll just get them out of the way. They usually develop from some form of subtle rhythmic body movement and they aren't really alpha, they're just artifacts that are in the alpha range. Uh, one of the most common sources is eye saccades and at the top here you can see here's a brain map type of um, 19 channel recording. And if you look uh, up at the top, I expanded it at the bottom, you can see these waves. They almost look like alpha waves. They appear to be monophasic, mostly in one direction. You can see that there's a slight up and down to them. But they tend to be sit on top of the um, zero line. We have all these zero lines that each of the traces follow. And that zero line is the um, point at which positive swings uh, in, this, in the EEG shift into negative swings. EEG, if you remember, has a positive and negative swing. Okay, um, they're rhythmic and continuous. Again, most alpha spindles to some degree, unless it's fairly pathological from a drug. Uh, you could get some continuous alpha or um, from uh, something like hypothyroid, you could get some fairly continuous alpha, but healthy alpha is usually spindling. So this is continuous. That's one of the reasons you know it's an artifact. In fact, Marvin Sams said to me once, he said, one of the best ways to identify artifact is that it's a continuous event. It's one of the key features of an artifact. And then the frequency range can be between eight and 13 Hertz just like in alpha. In fact, um, there are people uh, in the field who are medical EEG technologists like Jay Gunkelman who have uh, presented the uh, artifact, this eye movement artifact that up as fast as 13, 14, 15 cycles a second. Now that's rare, but it's possible. So that's a subtle form of artifact, but uh, you can spot it pretty easily if you see that kind of uh, mostly monophasic pattern and it's just continuous. Now eye movement is um, uh, a big problem in EEG. You know, if we try to train frontally at FP1, FP2, we get eye blinks and eye movements to the left and right and eye movements up and down. People aren't usually that aware that they're moving their eyes and the saccades uh, um, can really cause um, problems a lot of times. So here's an example of eye movement here uh, and uh, here's an example of lid movement. The lids moving up and down. The lids moving over the eyes create a, a large charge which travels across the skin and gets into the sensors and you have to understand that 
electrical charges are traveling across your skin all the time from muscle movement and from uh, electrical activity in your environment. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But eye movement can generate a pretty strong charge. And uh, when we look at uh, an EEG, like a 19-channel classic EEG, you can see these eye blinks. Now, they also look kind of monophasic because there's so much in one direction. And they're usually a downward deflection. They're actually uh, diphasic because you can see a little bump up there, but they look kind of monophasic. And um, that's from the eyes blinking and eyes moving. Um, you can also get theta artifact from the eye saccades because eye saccades can also move in the theta range. And that can be even harder to detect than the alpha. But again, look for that kind of um, uh, monophasic appearance. Um, and it would be in a more upward direction, and it would be continuous. You can get um, theta also from a degrading electrode connector. Sometimes if the uh, connectors, the DIN connectors that you push in um, to the um, amplifier, sometimes those uh, start to get a coating on them, or they create um, very slight coating on them from oxidation or they might just get worn, and that can produce sometimes an elevated theta, and that's uh, something you really have to look out for. Some, the theta will usually be like two or three times higher um, than your typical uh, uh, theta. So that's one of the ways you can tell that one hemisphere will be much higher than the other. You might want to jiggle your sensor at that point if you see that. Delta artifacts and beta artifacts are the most abundant at either end of the spectrum, and that's why on the new mind map system, there's a little red light goes off under delta or beta if it has the features of artifact. And the system looks at amplitude, phase, and coherence, and it's pretty darn accurate at capturing artifact. Now, we monitor artifact at the worst artifact points, like FP1, FP2, F7, F8, T3, T4, O1, O2, because um, those are the areas that most typically have the artifact and the highest artifact, uh, and you they'll be the first ones to generate artifacts. So when you see those lights off, those are the areas. You kind of want to look to see how high the delta or beta is. Delta artifacts usually come from poor ground connections, ear clip movement, uh, heartbeat, or what we call cardioballistic, toe tapping, very insidious, eye saccades, eye blinks, sweat or hot flashes, poor ground impedance, and amplifier saturation. So we're going to go over each of these and look at them uh, so you can see what they look like. So here's lead movement due to body movement. And you can see those big swings now, those big swings sometimes look a little bit like sweat artifact if you've got somebody who's heavily sweating, uh, but people usually don't he sweat that quite that heavily, uh, but they might be moving around a little bit. Um, and what's happening is the leads um, might be swinging as they move, or if it's a cap, it might be um, uh, jiggling the... Uh, the main lead that comes off the back of the cap going to the amp. It's harder to get this pattern with a cap than it is with single leads, but um, you can get it. One of the things you can do with single leads is to braid them a little bit, and that helps reduce um, the induction uh, of a voltage into them, and we'll talk more about how that occurs, but that's one of the things that is happening here. So the bodies. Can I mention something about bald-headed men? Because if they're bald, and they tend to have be you know warm-headed, then it begins to melt the paste, and then you'll see some of that as well, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. But it's usually a little subtler, and I have a picture of the sweat. Yeah. Um, oh, good. This is heavy uh, body movement. If you see a pattern like this, um, the, the, we're getting a high beta in, here on this side, and we're getting huge amounts of delta, uh, very high, so high, it's not even recognizable as EEG almost. But, um, you know, the connections are good, but the 
person is moving a lot. So if you have a new mind system and you're recording a map, that's something you might see. Uh, here we have a poor ground or reference. Now that does produce something that looks like a lot of delta. I mean a lot of beta, sorry. But there's also quite a bit of delta in, in it. And I'll show you some uh, of FFT uh, spectral displays where you can see that more clearly in a minute. But if you have um, the ground is not connected well or the reference is not connected well, this is the pattern you see. This is very poor EEG. You can't do a map with this. This is the pattern that most people struggle with when they first start brain mapping and they put the gel in the cap and they can't quite get it uh, a good connection and they keep thinking, oh, there's something wrong with the cap or something wrong with the amplifier and they call up and they say, you know, the, the equipment's not working right. And we'll have them... Um, wiggle the um, uh, the blunt needle around a little bit in the cap to try to get the gel through the hair and that'll bring it down and they might still not get a good pattern and they say oh it's the equipment or it's the software is not working right and again that's not the case in 99 percent of the time they still just haven't gotten a good connection if you take a little um, swab with a wooden dowel at the end uh, that they use uh, medically and put the dowel into the uh, hole where the sensor is on the cap and twist it a little bit, that almost always gets the gel through um, anything that's on the skin, including the dead skin, and gets you a nice signal. Now, you don't want to twist those things too hard or push too hard. If you break the skin, you create uh, a, a problem in terms of hygiene, okay? And so, uh, we don't want uh, blood or fluid coming out of you know the scalp uh, that creates a problem in cleaning the cap you know now you have to use um, some extreme measures to clean the cap if you're getting that because you could transmit disease that way and there is no reason to do that and we'll show you more about this but you don't have to get your equipment down to 5k ohms I don't care who's saying what uh, none of them are, if they're saying it, know anything about electronics and they haven't looked at the research because the research contradicts this crazy idea of having to get things down to 5K or even 10K. It's absurd. We'll look at more of that technically as we move along. So this is one of the biggest stumbling blocks. We're always trying to get um, rid of this big fuzzy looking EEG and it's usually a poor ground or ear clip reference and a lot of times when people are injecting gel in the caps they forget to put gel in the ground. It even happens to me uh, and if you do you're going to get signals that look like this and you put gel in the ground and boom it's really good. Okay in this case we can see the, the, the ground and the ear clips uh, are looking pretty good but um, uh, we're not getting good connections here. Let's jump over here. Uh, another thing you see uh, with poor uh, impedance, ground impedance, uh, sometimes you can get a fairly good signal on some software. Um, for instance, this is a uh, signal coming into a BioExplorer software, but we can see that we're not we're getting 60 hertz and uh, uh, hum into the signal here. That's what this little red line means here compared to the green. And when you see that, you see these big wide swings. Here's the spectral display with, from the FFT. And that's showing you um, all the frequencies from 0 up to 30 uh, hertz. And you can see big wide swings I mean, in this. Uh, they, they swing really high up, and then they crash down, and then they swing really high up, and then they crash down. And you're going to like, what's going on with my software or my amp? It's just poor ground connections. Uh, here's uh, insufficient gel at PZ, you know, putting gel in your cap. And uh, you can see FP1 is looking pretty good. It's a clean line. It's low power, but it's there. FP2 is clean. But PZ, it's just traveling all over the place. It's going crazy up and down. When you see things making wild swings like that, it's usually you just don't have enough gel or paste. So that would be the case for that. 
Another one that's very insidious um, is ear clip movement. Uh, a lot of times people will have very thick long hair uh, or they'll have, uh, if it's wintertime, they'll come in with a, uh, a shirt or they might be cold and sitting in a jacket in, in the chair. And if they are, you need, really need to look at the collar and where it is in relationship to the ear clips because the ear clips hang down from the ear and they can um, subtly uh, bang on the ear clips and wiggle them and uh, that will cause artifact especially if you don't have a goodly amount of paste on the ear clip for people who are stingy with paste it will make it doubly easy to create it uh, so here I have a um, a brain master and we're showing um, the ear clip banging on the uh, on the collar and you see sometimes we're getting kind of it looks like a delta wave it's actually amplifier saturation uh, and we'll talk about that more later and then other times there's these big downward deflections uh, from the uh, ear clip hitting the collar and this can give you really elevated delta if you look at the trend screen. In fact, it also can give you elevated theta. So if we uh, look at somebody who's training, um, here's somebody uh, with their baseline, and then here's that same person who wore a, a high collar shirt, and uh, on one side the ear clip kept banging against the collar. You know, they would just move their head subtly. It doesn't take much, just enough to keep hitting that collar with the ear clip or against the hair, and you'll get this highly elevated uh, delta and theta. And that could be um, really confusing. I mean, you might think, wow, what's happening to that person's brain uh, on that side? You know, it, it, what's going on? And it could be the left side or the right side. In this case, it's the left side. You can see the numbers are quite high. Um, and we're getting um, on the averages in the 20s and 30s. But look at the big difference between that left side and the right. I mean, that's that's more than double at one point here. It's triple. Now, if they had triple, um, that would be an indicator of something seriously wrong from a neurological perspective. And you rarely see this pattern, particularly in neurofeedback clinics. But it would always be this way if it was a neurological issue, typically. I mean, there are exceptions, but it would typically always be this way. So you wouldn't have one time where it would be low like this, and then the next time it would be really high in one hemisphere only. Now, if it was both hemispheres, okay, that might be from uh, sleep deprivation. But just in one hemisphere, there's usually a, this is an artifact that's occurring. So watch for the ear clip artifact. Another artifact that we see quite often is uh, electrode movement or electrode pop. And you see right here, in this area here, is um, a pop. And um, in this case, it's deflecting in different directions because uh, this is um, not a standard uh, reference uh, recording. But um, poor fitting caps, you know, they'll, they can often puff up at the top at CZ or PZ, and they can pull uh, on the electrode. Uh, if you're recording with for a map, and that little pull can cause a pop. And it, it just pulls the electrode away and, and causes a big uh, delta deflection. So that's what you're seeing there. So that's not a spike. Usually when people have spikes in their EEG, they come periodically. Uh, this uh, in a fairly rhythmic pattern. You'll see as, once every two seconds or three seconds. With an electrode pop, it's just an occasion. It's here and there, and it's more related to how they move. So if you're seeing something like that, it's always important to look over at the person and see if they move at the same time you're getting that kind of uh, pattern. If that's the case, then you know uh, that it's probably an electrode pop. So it's a little trickier, but that's the way to distinguish between electrode pop and me, maybe a sharp wave or a spike. Now here's a, a classic pattern that people usually pick up on, but sometimes they don't. They think, oh, this person has got spikes. And this does look like a spike. I mean, it's kind of sharp, and it's upward deflection, deflecting. Um, 
uh, and uh, it's it's fairly rhythmic. The problem is, is it's too rhythmic. This kind of rhythm, where it's just steadily beating out a pattern, that's a heartbeat. If it was a, a sharp wave or a spike, it would be less um, consistent and it would be less frequent. So that's a heartbeat. That would be a cardioballistic, as we call them. Here's another example of a pulse artifact. Uh, this looks almost like delta, doesn't it? Again, like a lot of artifacts, it tends to look kind of um, uh, one-sided. It's deflected up. It's not biphasic. It's monophasic. And uh, in, in appearance, not naturally, but in appearance. And it's steady. Again, notice how steady that is. Uh, and it's a consistent train. Uh, that is another clue. Now, um, this is from 01. Again, these um, uh, heartbeat artifacts or cardioballistics, they tend to occur in people who have uh, fairly broad chests and wide, short necks. And uh, uh, that might sound like we're picking on people's um, uh, body uh, appearance, but it's not. It's just a fact that those people tend to produce these kind of artifacts. So you want to look at the person, you know, uh, you know, after going to, if they're an endomorph or an ectomorph, just, you know, is their neck kind of short? Is it kind of wide? Is it kind of broad in the chest? Are you getting that pattern? Well, it's probably a heartbeat. Um, so there you go. Now, this one is very insidious. This is toe tapping. Uh, and um, this is what it tends to look like um, when you have toe tapping. It's like, what is all this wavy delta that's steady in the map? My God, what's going on with them? Uh, and then you look over at them, and they are like a stone statue. Their eyes aren't blinking. Their head's not moving. There's no subtle movements. Their hands are still. Their arms are moved, are still. And you're thinking... What is wrong with my equipment? Or is there something off with the software? But if you look down their leg, and it looks like their leg's not moving, at the very bottom, you'll see this subtle tapping of the toe. And that will produce this kind of artifact. And it will do when they're training, too. So one of the ways you avoid this is getting people's feet up. So if you can... It's always useful to get people to get their feet up. It calms down both children and adults and uh, tends to make them sit more quietly. But be sure if you have somebody who's in a chair uh, and they're kind of slouching there, look for that toe tap. That can really uh, bugger things up. Now, here's a slow roving eye. Uh, one of the ways you can tell that is that Right here, if you're looking at it, um, this particular pattern here, the eyes are coming together and then coming apart. Um, that's movement laterally, left and right. So that's the pattern you see. The, the waves come together and they move apart. So that's just eye movement. There it is again. That's more pronounced there. That's at the front. Um, these are lateral eye movements and that's what they look like here's an eye blink now these are all delta all of these produce false delta in your amplitudes and your FFT spectral displays uh, here's an eye blink you can see it's a big strong downward deflection with that slight upward deflection and an eye blink could be either in delta where it just appears once or could be like every second and that would you know start getting you in, into the theta range or higher um, sometimes uh, let's see where this looks like we've got about three in a second here so that would be high amplitude delta if this epic was a whole second we'd have four we'd be into theta some people blink um, continuously when they're anxious and fairly rapidly and other people blink more slowly. So depending on how fast they're blinking, you could get false um, 
delta or false theta, even theoretically alpha. But that's a really anxious person. So here's an eye blink, um, okay, doing a, a map with the new mind system. Uh, this, some, this eye blink looks like a, a, again, monophasic, like an upward deflection, but they also um, can go up and down both, but it's good to see different patterns. So I'm showing you, um, you know, what you might see if you're doing 19 channels at a time and maybe something that you might see doing four channels at the time, either one can occur to different formats, but it gives you an idea of what you're looking for. Now this is up and down eye movement. Again, it'll uh, inflate the average amplitude of the delta. Uh, it'll get your artifact light going off. You notice over here on the right, our artifact light's going on. When that artifact light goes on, uh, the EEG just gets um, dumped. It doesn't get into the trend screen very much and it doesn't get recorded uh, in terms of power. And it will stop your clock if you're training somebody. So when you have people uh, looking up and down like that, um, that's a major delta artifact. Fortunately, when they're watching a screen or a television and they're tracking a movie, they're more likely to have some lateral eye movement than this up and down movement. But if you're doing a brain map, you'll see that, particularly with kids. You know, and that's why we ask them to watch the screen, just look at the screen, have something interesting to, to stare at, at the screen, a scene of some kind. And that way we can get minimal eye movement up and down or laterally. Salt bridge. Now, what are we talking about? Um, if you put too much gel in your cap in all of the locations, and a lot of times people who are just starting out doing caps, they'll put like a, a third or a half of a uh, um, of the whole amount that's in the uh, injector into one area that they're injecting into, which is the sensor. So, you know, if you have this syringe injector with a blunt needle and you've got it all filled up and you squeeze a third to a half of it out into one sensor, the little white things usually on the caps, um, that's going to ooze down the side of the head and make a connection maybe if you're at C3, it might get down into T3, or if you're at F3, it might get over down into the ground, which causes a real problem. Uh, if you get a salt bridge with the ground, you probably just get everything would look flat like this. If you have a cap and you've used it and then washed it and then hair dried it, you know, with a hair dryer, um, uh, and then put the cap on the next person and you get all low power that's almost flat like this, that means there's still moisture in the cap. And that's similar to a salt bridge and you'll get really low power, almost useless EEG. So beware of that. Now, here's what Rob was talking about, the bald-headed guy um, who's sweating a lot. These are the patterns that you would see. Um, uh, an upper right-hand side, again, is it almost looks like um, lateral eye movement. It's a gentle rolling pattern. Uh, you tend to see that gentle rolling pattern more with hot flashes. When people have hot flashes, they'll often generate that pattern too. And that's the uh, uh, sweat glands being really activated and sweat welling up in, into the, in the paste and the space between the, the paste and the, and the skin. And that completely offers what, alters what we call the DC offset. It alters the um, um, amplitude of the voltage in that area. And we'll show you some pictures and explain this more, but that's what's causing this gentle rolling pattern that you'll see. Here's some profuse sweat. I liked this one in particular because this is typically more what I would see um, uh, with my uh, old equipment, particularly with the old uh, uh, equipment back in the 90s that had very low input impedance. Um, We'll talk more about input impedance in a, in a few minutes. But when you have low input impedance on an amplifier and people start sweating, it really creates a mess like this. Now, all the amps you're using these days are much higher input. 
uh, especially new mind and brain master. Those are very high input. So not a problem. So that brings us to the topic of amplifier saturation. Now, people will often see this big square thing in workshops when I'm uh, doing the first early workshops with people. They often look at this and look like, oh my God, what's going on in this person's brain? Is that a seizure? And uh, no, you can see that really nice EEG here and nice EEG here. And you get this developing polyphasic waveform. Can you see that up here? It says polyphasic. You can see that, that notch going up and down. And, um, and what's happening is that the person is moving and you're not noticing, this could be a toe tapper actually, you're not noticing the movement, and the input wave, which is fairly sinusoidal, you can see it's fairly smooth and up and down like this, um, the energy from the movement induces more voltage into the wires than should be there. It overrides the EEG voltage, which is in the microvolts, so you have millivolts getting induced in a wire that's designed for microvolts, and the amp's designed for microvolts, and it just overdrives the amp, and we get what we call uh, clipping or saturation. Um, and so you see the amplifier st tries to make the big wave, and, and it can't. It gets squared out, and you get this pattern. So... Uh, you know, so this is an amplifier symbol down here. It looks like a triangle. And with an amplifier, we put a little wave in and we get a big wave out. So I'm going to explain to you a little bit about amplifiers. You might not get it right away. You watch the video a couple of times and you'll get the basic concept. This is the pattern that we use, um, the sign. This is our hieroglyph in modern times for the transistor. And the transistor has three components, a base, a collector, and an emitter. And you have energy going into the base and through the emitter. And that's a small current. And this is where we put the EEG in. And if we have a small steady current and we add EEG voltage in, it makes that small steady current get bigger and smaller. That produces up and down waveform, like you see over on the right here. That's your input. Now, we also have... Um, the collector and emitter with voltage going through this way, but it's a much larger current flow. It has a lot more power. But the little um, up and down here, the EEG gets mirrored in this big wave. And so we get this little wave producing an output of a big wave. And that's how a transistor, what we call NPN junction, any transistors amplify things. Now, don't get too scared. We're just going to talk about this briefly. This is what's called a schematic on the left side, a network, an amplifier trans uh, network. And again, you can see we've got a little bit of energy going in here. This little sign over here is the battery power. It's putting in uh, up to 5 volts. So we have to get just the right amount of voltage. Otherwise, the thing gets too too unstable. And then we have this other power this battery is putting in here. And uh, these little squiggly lines control how much energy is flowing. Okay, that keeps it this, at the right energy amount. And we need to get this, this base where the EEG comes in. It has to be set at just the right point. We call it the Q point. If it's not set at the right point, then the swings... Uh, that are being mirrored in the EEG. If we had a big delta, the swings might be too big. And it just throws so much current through the amplifier that it clips the signal. And so, you know, they do all this calculation of, well, what's the best way to, what's the best energy to set this base energy going in so we don't overdrive uh, this part going on the output? And this is what happens. Here's the energy going in, and the uh, base is set too high. That Let's say the base was set at 10 instead of 5. It would overdrive the output of the amplifier. The swings would be so big that the amplifier couldn't handle it, and it would just cut off the waves. So that's what's happening when we get these big cutoffs. You can watch that a couple of times. Maybe... It'll kind of make sense. Now, here's beta artifacts. These are often the most difficult to detect. They have a saw 
tooth waveform. That's what makes them so readily identifiable. Uh, they can often be from poor connections. They can be from multiple muscle sources. They can be from electromagnetic forces around you or dirty electricity. You know what's coming out of your wall socket. Um, they can be from muscle tension with subharmonics, and the harmonics from muscle tension could go down to 13 cycles a second. That's low beta or SMR. Um, beta over 21 hertz is mostly artifact, and uh, that's been uh, just pretty well established by research. Uh, people increase their beta when they get drowsy, and if beta is over 10 microvolts, there's a good chance you're looking at artifact. So some of the things we can think about. I said beta was sawtooth. Well, what do I mean? Well, here are the four basic types of waves that um, we find in the world. Uh, we have smooth waves, which we see a lot in the EEG. We have square waves and triangular waves and sawtooth waves. Uh, each of the instruments in the symphony produce different forms of waves that give them their characteristic sound. Flutes are kind of nice and smooth like this. You know, uh, violins might be more like uh, one of these others, like triangular. But EMG is always sawtooth. You see this, how it looks here? If we plot, um, Plot it on a graph of EEG. You can see it kind of looks sawtoothy, up and down, sharp. And it's biphasic, right, up and down. Here's a nice biphasic sawtooth pattern made by a signal generator. It's kind of stuff that we run through our um, amplifiers to test them with oscilloscopes here at Newmind. And then if you look here, you can see uh, muscle tension, EMG. This could also be 60 hertz. They, they're in the same frequency area, and it's hard to often tell which is which, which can be very frustrating. But you can see how the waveform kind of translates. So when we look at muscle tension, EMG, in a map, this is a classic pattern. This is coming from the, the uh, temporal region. Um, person's got a lot, and people often have a lot of muscle tension in the temporal region because they clench their jaw. People with anxiety disorders or head traumas typically clench their jaw. Um, it can be one-sided or both-sided. Um, uh, in EMG, the electrical source is the muscle membrane potential, about negative 90 millivolts. Uh, measured EMG potentials of the entire range is between less than 50 microvolts and up to 30 millivolts, depending on the muscle under observation. So that's a big change from 50 microvolts, which is kind of where most people's EEG peaks out. And then we're into 30 millivolts, which is way past that point. So you can see that if you're getting uh, electrical information from moving muscles traveling across the skin, into your sensor, which is designed for microvolts, you're going to flood it and get that saturation. The typical amplitude range of EMG is between 0 and 10 millivolts. Uh, so that's more typically what we see, unless you're really you know, crunching down on your muscles. Um, and EMG signals acquire noise while traveling through different tissues. So EMG can also pick up 60 hertz signal. Eh? pick up all kinds of garbage, uh, just like a tsunami picking up garbage in the ocean. Uh, dominant energy range for EMGs between 50 and 100 hertz, 150 hertz, of course, it can go higher. Uh, the frequency range of the motion noise is usually uh, 1 to 10 hertz, uh, mostly 1 to 7 hertz. Um, 60 hertz uh, line noise and its four harmonics can generate uh, 120, 180, 240, and 300 hertz. But we're not usually looking at that because we have what's called a low-pass filter, which cuts all that stuff out. The problem is, is that we have subharmonics that might include 30 hertz, 20 hertz, 15 hertz, and all the interharmonics in between. So muscle tension can produce the subharmonics. And so here's a pattern which shows you um, on the right side, there's your muscle tension at the top. There's a graph showing 0 to 500 cycles a second, and the power uh, millivolts probably on, on the left side. And you can see the, the distribution of the power across the frequency from the muscle. And notice it goes all the way down. It looks like the 0 here. But if we 
look at a graph like this one on the left, we can see that most of the muscle, you know, when somebody's tensing their muscle, falls off uh, below 20 hertz, typically as low as 13 hertz. Now, there's been laboratory work that showed sometimes it can get down as far as 8, and you can see that on your spectral display in your FFT. When people really tense up, you can see it flood in, but most of the time when you're doing neural feedback, it usually doesn't get down below beta. Um, so here it is there, and there's an example on a trend screen, a new mind trend screen of somebody. This is 36 um, microvolts. Uh, I mean, that's ridiculous. Nobody can do that with their brain. People say, oh, my God, what's going on with that brain? They actually um, persuade themselves after reading the course that this person somehow could do this much uh, high-frequency activity. Your brain just can't do it. Forget about it. And you see down here it says 20 um, uh, microvolts of EMG are showing up here. Now, this is probably a subharmonic. There's probably a lot of millivolts of EMG producing this subharmonic of 20 because it loses energy, as you saw, as the subharmonics lose energy as it goes down. The energy peak here is around 40 or 60, <laughs> right around where the um, the noise from the electrical plugs comes in and then it falls off. So you can see the electrical activity and the EMG fall off in similar patterns and you could, this could be from uh, electrical activity or muscle tension. So you kind of have to get people to relax and, and check your connections to see which it is. So here's somebody um, doing a, a low EMG session at C3, C4 um, there's the delta and theta. It's about 10. That's good. Delta's a little higher, uh, maybe around 12, 13. This is a normal range, right? Of course, their alpha's way down here. This is a stressed out person with too much cortisol. Alpha's way down here. But um, notice that the uh, their beta's around 5 microvolts. But when we go to T3, T4, the voltage drops down because... There's a smaller voltage drop between the ear clip and T3, T4 than the ear clip and C3, C4. So we're collecting less voltage, so we have a lower amount of voltage. But look at where the, the beta is at this point. It was 5 here, but down closer to T3, T4, where the masseter muscle is, and people are you know, either gently clenching the jaw or having little spasms from TMJ, this e, this e, uh EMG, high beta, shows up as high beta, yellow, is around 10 microvolts. And notice that there is spillover from the filter at, in the high beta to the beta. See here, their beta and high beta are very close together, 4 to 5 microvolts. Here, notice that the beta is up at 9 or 10, I mean the high beta is up at 9 or 10 microvolts, and that's spilling over into the beta and dragging the beta up to 7 microvolts or higher. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's think about that for a minute. These waves, when you generate subharmonics, produce these distortions. And here we can see these different harmonics of the main wave. Um, so these are the fundamental, the main wave, and the harmonics produced. And you can see it produces more and more complicated waveform. When it gets complicated enough, it begins to look like a natural EEG. You know, and your EEG is beating together all of, all of the components from 1 to 30 hertz. So it's a pretty complicated waveform. Um, here's EMG. Uh, there's a, a moderate level. You can see this spiky biphasic pattern here. Notice that it's pushing um, the beta up quite high. This beta is as high as the alpha here. The yellow and the red are as high as the blue on the FFT. If you jump over here, we can see even higher amplitude, spikier stuff, and it's even getting into the high beta frequencies more. And notice how high the yellow and the red beta are, and, and even the alpha looks higher. So it's spilling over into the alpha even. It's so intense. It's overwhelming the amplifier. It's creating clipping, and it's, um, it's spilling over into other filters. Here's a swallow. It looks like a little, little blips like this. 
Here's tense shoulder muscles. Here's your normal EEG. And then notice it starts to get very big here. Uh, it almost looks like uh, alpha, right? So that shows you, again, spill over into lower frequencies. Here's a close-up. You can see other frequencies in here, alpha and theta. So it's quite a complex group of harmonics. It almost looks like real EEG, but it is muscle tension from the shoulders. And here's, uh, again, uh, that was new mine. Here's Brain Master showing a trapezius EMG from the shoulders. Again, we have, look at how high the high beta and beta are, and the alpha's even involved again here. Here's a frown. Okay, there's your regular EEG. The frown's not that easy to figure out. It's, but it's producing 10, uh, 10 microvolts, and that's too much. You see that 10 microvolts in a pattern like this? Odds are you're getting some frowning. So you watch their face, you know, see if they're frowning, get them to relax a little bit. And uh, it almost looks like regular EEG here. Here's neck and shoulders um, at O2. You can see the F3 and F4 look pretty nice. But compare this to that spiky biphasic compressed pattern of EMG. That's your that's your EMG in the back at O102. Um, thought I'd pull out um, the morphology of somebody who was about to have a grand mal in about 24 hours, but they had no symptoms. They're a predromal, and here's your that pattern we saw of spike and wave. And if you look at them, you can see how similar they are. Um, but this is a grand mal. This is a petite mal. You can see they still look fairly similar. This person's actually having the seizure. Uh, this person is not having it. They're predromal. They're going to have it. Uh, epileptiform activity is very rare. Uh, it's hard to produce even in a medical setting. Um, and if you think you're seeing something like that, it's best to refer them for uh, a medical EEG. Um, actually best to say, well, I'd like you to see a neurologist and not say anything more. We need to be very careful. There's a video on New Mind YouTube showing you really what your limitations are in terms of um, looking at morphology and reporting it to a client. It's very tricky. You have to be careful about what you're saying. You don't have a license to do that unless you're a neurologist who's uh, been trained. Here's a progressive injection of noise and EMF into uh, dirty electricity. And there's a nice wave. It could be an alpha wave, but it's a 10 hertz sine wave. And we're projecting more and more noise into it. And that could be coming from printers around your desk, Coke machines in your hallway that are plugged into your plug, into your electrical circuit, um, vacuum cleaners, air conditioners outside your window, routers in the wall on the other side, transformers sitting outside your window. They look like big green metal boxes sometimes. Poor wiring if you're in a really old building. Radio station towers, you may not even know what that one's around. And uh, they're producing a, a AM radio waves, amplitude modulated waves, which I mean, in the old days, amplitude modulated waves, when they're strong enough, could make people's frying pans uh, uh, talk to them. You know, they would hear the announcer through the frying pans, believe it or not. Um, and IT closets, where there's all these connections. Okay, so we've gotten up to, it's about 1 o'clock, we've gotten up to this point here. So I'm going to uh, stop off here, and uh, we'll pick up again uh, on another lunch and learn and discuss artifact a little bit more. Uh, it's a big topic. Um, and I will post this on new, my YouTube channel and then we'll post the part two as well. And we're going to start looking at other things about routers, across the room, subharmonics, look at uh, uh, displacement current from wiring and body capacitance. Um, we'll look at DC offset versus um, uh, your standard um, way of testing with ohm meters. Uh, we'll look at DC offset and the nature of it, what the electrical components are, how the skin affects it, and impedance. Uh, these are more topics, and I have to thank uh, uh, Dr. Morella, who uh, 
on LinkedIn posted a lot of the images I showed you of 19 channel EEG. Uh, if you want to see them for yourself or get them, you know, for yourself, uh, just go to LinkedIn and look at uh, Dr. Morella. It's up there for free. You can um, look at them and so forth. Just be sure to cite him and appreciate him. Okay, so we're done for today, and we'll continue with those others uh, down the road, maybe uh, on a neuro at night. Any last input or statements from Rob or Martin? Just thank you, Richard. That was good stuff, and hopefully, uh, uh, you know, they're going to post this on YouTube so yep. people can go back because it's a lot of good information because uh, some of those things are subtle, and I know we all see them. Anybody who's saying I never see this isn't paying attention to their training screen. <laughs> Absolutely true. Richard, thank you very much. It's uh, very conclusive. Um, maybe we can discuss a, co a couple of means to take to avoid these kinds of artifacts before well, that's we start what, capping. Yeah, and that's why we want to put together a, a panel of people um, who are familiar with this topic you know, at a more technical level, and we have a little panel and discuss the details more and how to avoid them more. Uh, that's a big topic, too, so I'd like to do um, yeah presentation like this so if you want to get together any information on that Martin uh, that would be much appreciated and uh, we could all discuss this more absolutely I, I know it's an area in point uh, four years ago or so so I could really supply information. yes yes I know you have some background enough technical background to be able to help a lot with this okay so uh, hope uh, that the rest of the week is good and uh, we'll uh, pick up uh, uh, maybe on some more things on Friday. Thanks, Richard. All righty. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. You're welcome. Bye, all. Bye-bye.